Will Kim Kardashian burn in hell forever simply because she is rich and enjoys good things in life? Help me, Jesus! Help, help me, Jesus! Many teach that the story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16 is a literal and actual account of three men. The rich man, the poor man Lazarus, and Abraham. They say that this story is telling us what they're actually doing while dead in Hades or the unseen. They call this the intermediate state, where the dead are actually alive, but they will somehow only be classified as being alive after their resurrection. Hmm. So what they're actually claiming this story teaches is that these three are the living dead, not the dead dead. And that goes for all the dead. According to Orthodox Christianity, all of the dead are actually alive somewhere. In reality, their teaching makes resurrection pointless and redundant. The people are already alive. What's the point of resurrection? In God's plan, resurrection of the dead is vital. That is the means he uses to bring them out of death and back into life. In addition, they say that the story of the rich man and Lazarus proves that people will suffer torment in hell for ever and ever. Myself and many others teach that this story from Jesus is a parable and not an actual account of literal events. By showing that this story from Jesus is a parable, my goal is to debunk two major false teachings that come from seeing this as a literal story of what happens in the realm of the dead. By seeing this as a parable, we see that the dead are actually dead and not alive somewhere else in God's universe. And secondly, by seeing this as a parable, we will realize that none of the dead are being tormented in flames in death. Before we look at this story that Jesus told, let's look at the crowd that actually heard this story, many of whom he was addressing directly. The Pharisees. We can see who the crowd was that heard the five parables from Jesus in Luke 15 through 16. From Luke 15, 1 through 2, and Luke 16, 1. Now all the tribute collectors and sinners were coming near him to be hearing him. And both the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying that this man sinners is receiving and is eating with them. And in chapter 16, verse 1, Now he said to his disciples also. So this was a full crowd. The tribute collectors, sinners, Pharisees and scribes, and the disciples of Christ all heard these parables from his lips. In Luke 16, 19 through 31, we read the parable of the rich man and Lazarus from the concordant literal New Testament. Now a certain man was rich, and he dressed in purple and cambric, daily making merry splendidly. Now there was a certain poor man named Lazarus, who had been cast at his portal, having ulcers, and yearning to be satisfied from the scraps which are falling from the rich man's table. But the curse also coming licked his ulcers. Now the poor man came to die, and he is carried away by the messengers into Abraham's bosom. Now the rich man also died and was entombed. And in the unseen, lifting up his eyes, existing in torments, he is seeing Abraham from afar and Lazarus in his bosom. Verse 24, And he shouting said, Father Abraham, be merciful to me and send Lazarus that he should be dipping the tip of his finger in water and cooling my tongue, for I am pained in this flame. Now Abraham said, Child, be reminded that you got your good things in your life and Lazarus likewise evil things. Yet now here he is being consoled, yet you are in pain. And in all this between us and you a great chasm has been established, so that those wanting to cross hence to you may not be able, nor yet those thence may be ferrying to us. Yet he said, I am asking you then, Father, that you should be sending him into my father's house. For I have five brothers, so that he may be certifying to them, lest they also may be coming into this place of torment. Verse 29, Yet Abraham is saying to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. Yet he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone should be going to them from the dead, they will be repenting. Yet he said to him, If Moses and the prophets they are not hearing, either will they be persuaded if someone should be rising from among the dead. There are some serious problems for those who take this account literally. 
The first and probably the biggest problem is the reason that Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom and the reason that the rich man is being tormented in flame. We see the reasons why the rich man is where he is and Lazarus is where he is. According to the parable, in verse 19, it mentions a certain man was rich. And in verse 20, it says a certain poor man. Now, verse 25, Abraham lays out the reason why they are in the positions they're in. Now, Abraham said, child, be reminded that you got your good things in your life and Lazarus likewise evil things. Yet now, here he is being consoled, yet you are in pain. These are the only reasons given in the parable for why these two are in the position they are. One was rich and got good things. One was poor and received evil things in this life. The result in the end is pain for the rich man, consolation for the poor man. <coughs> if you take this story literally, are you willing to say that one's final position is based on their bank account and how much good or evil they received in this life and not the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Are you really willing to go that far? If so, in the comments below, please provide me with scripture that shows that it's your bank account and your reception of good or evil in this life that determines your final position with God. Some have said this is a literal account because Jesus does not call it a parable. It is the fifth parable in a series of five parables in Luke 15 through 16. Let's take a look at those five parables right now. Here's a list of the five parables that Jesus told in Luke 15 through 16. First, we have the parable of the one lost sheep, which he actually calls a parable. Second, we have the parable of the one lost coin, which is not called a parable. Third, we have a parable of the prodigal son, which is not called a parable. Fourth, we have the parable of the unjust steward, which is not called a parable. And fifth, we have the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, which also is not called a parable. So the fact that the rich man and Lazarus is not called a parable does not mean that it is not a parable. These parables were intended by Jesus to reveal God's love and beneficial work for all sinners and to accuse those who despise God's love and beneficial work for all sinners. Another strong piece of evidence that shows that this story is a parable is found four chapters later in Luke 20 where Jesus tells us very clearly that Abraham is dead, dead dead. So in Luke 16, we have Abraham chumming it up with Lazarus the poor man talking to the rich man who is tormented in flame and in chapter 20 we have him dead so is Abraham dead or is he alive if he is in fact dead which Jesus said he was this is very strong evidence that we are looking at a parable in the rich man and Lazarus which leads us to the conclusion that the dead are dead and no one is being tormented in flame in death let's take a look at that passage right now in luke 20 37 through 38 we read the words of christ now that the dead are rousing even moses divulges at the thorn bush as he is terming the lord the god of abraham and the god of isaac and the god of jacob now god is he not of the dead but of the living for all to him are living jesus is being questioned by the sadducees who said there is no resurrection. They came up with an elaborate question for him regarding future marriage after the resurrection. And Jesus set them straight, showing them from the Old Testament scriptures that there is indeed a resurrection. And it is based on the words of Moses, whom the Sadducees revered. We see at the beginning of verse 37, the subject of these two verses. Jesus tells us the dead are rousing. And who does he use as examples of the dead? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob from the lips of Moses. And he reinforces the fact that they are dead at the beginning of verse 38. Now God is he not of the dead, but of the living. So how is he the God of the living, but not the God of the dead? To understand this, we must understand the word God comes from the Greek theos and the definition of theos is placer which corresponds to the hebrew l which means subjector god is an active god he places people but this passage tells us that god is he not of the dead but of the living he is not placing the dead he is placing the living 
He is not moving the dead around. He is not animating them to do things in life. They are dead. The chessboard provides us with a good illustration of God placing the living, not the dead. While Abraham is on the board representing where the living are, God moves him to where he wants him. God places Abraham according to God's will. As the Apostle Paul said in Acts 17, 28, In God we are living and moving and are. Thus, he is the God or placer of the living and the living only. But just as in chess, when someone is removed from the board or the living and they are dead, God is no longer their God. He is no longer placing them until they are returned to the board through resurrection. But Moses could say of these dead men that God is their God. Now, how can he say this? Well, it's because of the future resurrection that is coming. The future resurrection that Jesus threw in the face of the Sadducees who said there is no resurrection. Here is why God can be called the God of someone who is dead, while at the same time not being the God of the dead. It's because God is already in the future after the dead have been resurrected to life. This is why Jesus said for all to him are living. It's in the future for us, but not for God. He is already there in the future, as we can see from the following verses. We must understand that God is not limited by time as we are. Isaiah 57, 15. For thus says the one high and lifted up, who tabernacles the future and holy is his name. God is already at the time and beyond when Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will be resurrected. Thus he can be called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even while they are literally dead. It's because of their future resurrection, and he is already there. He tabernacles the future. And we see in Romans 4:17 that he is the God who is vivifying the dead and calling what is not as if it were. From our perspective right now, Abraham is dead, and God is not the God of Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. But he can call it as though it is a reality, because to him it is. Just as it says at the end of Luke 20:38, for all to him are living. To us, all are not living. He's already in the future. He's already there when all are resurrected. He's already there when he will be all in all. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. From this evidence, we see that Abraham is very dead, and the story of the rich man and Lazarus is indeed a parable, not an actual account of literal events. Abraham was not chumming it up with Lazarus while scolding the rich man who was being tormented in flame. Only because he had a hefty amount of shekels in his bank account and was having a good time with the ladies. And no, Abraham didn't die somewhere between Luke chapter 16 and Luke chapter 20. Ever since he died the first time, he's been dead. He was dead through the entirety of Jesus' ministry, and he remains dead today. So because he is dead, God is currently, at this moment, not his God. He is not his placer. On the heels of this truth from Luke 20, some have asked me this very good question. So this says God is not the God of the dead, but in Romans 14, it says that Jesus is the Lord of the dead and the living. What about that? Huh? I say, great question. Let's have a look and see what that verse says. Romans 14, 9 says, For for this Christ died and lives, that he should be Lord of the dead as well as of the living. First, notice the two distinct groups, the dead and the living. If all are currently alive in some shape or form, then all would be the living, and there would be no dead. There will be a time when all are living, as we saw in Luke 20, but that is in the future, when death is abolished and only life remains, 1 Corinthians 15, 26. Christ, through his obedience to his Father, bought all things and all people, whether they were dead or alive at the time that he bought them. Therefore, he is the Lord of all of the dead and all of the living. The word Lord comes from the Greek kurios, and it means master, one who has authority over others, a person exercising absolute ownership rights. And we see from the scriptures how Christ the Lord wields his absolute authority even over the dead. In John 5, 25 and 28 through 29, we see the authority of Jesus as Lord of the dead as well as the living. 
Verily, verily, I am saying to you, that coming is an hour, and now is, when the dead shall be hearing the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear shall be living. Marvel not at this, for coming is the hour in which all who are in the tombs shall hear his voice, and those who do good shall go out into a resurrection of life, yet those who commit bad things into a resurrection of judging. We see clearly Christ the Lord authority over the dead. Whether Abraham is dead or alive, Christ Jesus is his master. But God is only his God or placer while Abraham is alive, not while he is dead. If we quickly go back to Luke 20, 37 through 38, we can see that Lord and God, Kyrios and Theos are used together in this passage. Now that the dead are rousing, even Moses divulges at the thorn bush, as he is terming the master, the placer of Abraham, and the placer of Isaac, and the placer of Jacob. Now placer is he not of the dead, but of the living, for all to him are living. So we see how God in this passage can be both Lord master, while not being God placer. Of the dead, even Christ, while he was dead, was not being placed by his father. Now let's take a quick look at some verses throughout the scriptures that reinforce the big truth of God, that the dead are really the dead dead not the living dead, and that God is not placing them here, or there, or anywhere. Remember that the story of the rich man and Lazarus takes place in the unseen. Ecclesiastes 9.5 But the dead know nothing whatsoever. Ecclesiastes 9.10 For there is no doing, or devising, or knowledge, or wisdom in the unseen, aka Sheol or Hades, where you are going. Psalm 6.5 For in death there is no remembrance of you, in the unseen, Sheol or Hades, who shall acclaim you? Psalm 115, 17 through 18. The dead cannot praise Yah, nor all those descending into stillness. But we, the living, we shall bless Yah, henceforth and unto the eon. Praise Yah. In Revelation 25, the rest of the dead do not live until the thousand years should be finished. The key phrase in that verse is, the dead do not live. I have a request for those in Orthodox Christianity that have used the parable of the rich man and Lazarus to threaten people with everlasting or eternal torment in flame. Stop doing this. You are misusing this passage. This passage is not meant to teach eternal suffering for anyone, whether they are currently dead or whether they will be resurrected in the future and face judgment from God. Please, Orthodox Christianity, stop misusing God's scripture. Based on all the information we've looked at here, the next thing on the itinerary for the dead, all of the dead, is their resurrection when they hear the voice of Christ call them out of the dead. Some will come out into a resurrection of life. Some will come out into a resurrection of judging. But keep in mind this key fact. The judge of all is also the savior of all. I have a question for you. Would you be opposed to watching this next video? Thank you.